Hello, young soul. Welcome to the Daily Horror Channel. If you are afraid of real and scary reports, this channel is not for you. I suggest you leave this video. But if you are not afraid of listening to these horrifying reports, I suggest you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next stories. And the small town of St. Bartholomew, there was a bookstore called Relics of Time, famous for its rare and antique books. Among its dusty shelves and narrow aisles, locals and tourists found a haven for their curious minds. The atmosphere was welcoming, with the smell of aged paper and ancient wood permeating the air. But hidden among the forgotten volumes was a dark artifact that would change the life of anyone who found it, the Death Diary. My name is Lucas. I am 25 years old, and I am a literature student at the University of St. Bartholomew. Ever since I was a child, I have been fascinated by old books and stories. The Relics of Time bookstore was one of my favorite places, where I would spend hours exploring and searching for rarities. One rainy afternoon, while looking for a book for my research, I found an old diary with a worn leather cover and pages yellowed by time. The title, almost illegible, intrigued me. The Death Diary. I sat down in an armchair at the back of the bookstore and began to leaf through the diary. The first few pages were trivial entries by a man named Joachim, dating back to the early 19th century. However, as I continued reading, the entries became increasingly macabre. Joachim described detailed and violent deaths, each one more gruesome than the last. What terrified me most was realizing that the names of the victims and the circumstances of their deaths corresponded to people who had lived in São Bartolomeu, I decided to take the diary home, thinking that I could use it as a basis for research. But that night, something changed. When I opened the diary again, I noticed that there was a new entry, dated the previous day. The description was of a man who had been run over on the corner of my street. I looked out the window and saw the movement of police cars and ambulances. A shiver ran down my spine. The deaths described in the diary were happening in real time. I told my friend Mateus about the discovery who, although skeptical, was curious. Lucas, this is just a macabre coincidence, he said, but his expression betrayed growing fear. Over the next few days, the diary entries continued, each describing a death in disturbing detail. The whispers began to haunt me. Shadows moved in the corners of my eyes and objects in my room shifted. The diary seemed to take on a life of its own, feeding on the fear it caused. One day, while in the university library, I felt a sharp chill and heard whispers coming from every direction. The lights flickered and the shadows seemed to lengthen and writhe. I ran outside, panting only to find Mateus waiting for me. Lucas, we have to stop this, he said, his voice shaking. This diary is driving us crazy, but I was determined to find out the truth. We returned to the bookstore and confronted the owner, Mr. Almeida, an elderly man with a vast knowledge of rare books. He looked at the diary with a grim expression. This diary belonged to a cursed man, he explained. Joachim made a pact with a dark entity, exchanging human lives for forbidden knowledge. Each death recorded in the diary strengthens the entity. We felt a chill at hearing this, but sir, Almeida continued, the only way to stop the deaths is to destroy the diary, but that won't be easy. The entity won't let you get rid of it. We decided to burn the diary that night. We gathered at Mateus's house and lit a bonfire in the backyard. As I threw the diary into the flames, the whispers turned to deafening screams, and an unseen force tried to pull the book away from the flames. The shadows around us writhed frantically, forming grotesque, menacing figures. Fight it! I shouted, feeling the panic rising. With a last effort, we pushed the diary back into the fire. The flames intensified, and the screams turned to a wail of pain before fading away. The feeling of oppression eased, and the shadows returned to normal. We felt a temporary peace, but we knew that the entity was still there, waiting for another opportunity. We returned inside, exhausted and shaken. We felt that the battle was far from over, 
and that the ancient and powerful entity still lurked waiting for another opportunity. Over the next few days, I tried to return to my routine, but the fear would not let me. The nightmares persisted, and the feeling of being watched never completely disappeared. One night, while reviewing notes in my room, I heard the soft sound of pages turning. I looked at the bookshelf and saw a new journal, identical to the previous one, lying among my books. I hugged myself, trying to push away the growing fear. I picked up the diary with trembling hands and opened it. The first entry described Matthew's death in gruesome detail. I ran to the phone, but when I called him I heard only silence on the other end. The entity had returned and it was stronger than ever. Desperate, I went to Mr. Almeida's house, where he greeted me with a somber expression. The entity cannot be destroyed easily, he said, but perhaps there is a way to bind it again. He gave me instructions for an ancient ritual, one that required courage and determination. We needed to perform the ritual in the bookstore where it all began. I gathered Matthew and Clara together explaining the plan. Despite their fear, they were willing to help. That night we returned to Relics of Time. The bookstore was darker than ever. The shadows seemed to move in an ominous way, and the air was freezing. We set up the altar in the center of the bookstore, lighting candles and drawing protective symbols on the floor. We began to chant the ancient words, and the bookstore responded immediately. The shadows on the walls took shape, transforming into grotesque figures that advanced upon us. We felt icy hands grabbing at us, trying to stop us. The feeling of oppression was overwhelming, but we continued to chant the ritual. Suddenly, the diary began to float in the air, radiating an eerie light. The entity appeared, a hooded figure with eyes glowing with hatred. You cannot banish me, it screamed, its voice reverberating like thunder. I am eternal. With one last desperate effort, I gathered all the amulets and threw them around the diary, reciting the final words of the ritual. The light shone brightly, and the entity screamed in agony, being sucked back into the diary. The shadows around us disappeared, and the feeling of oppression dissipated. We felt true peace for the first time since we had found the diary. Lord, Almeida took the diary and locked it in an ancient safe, sealing it with protective symbols. It will be safe here, he said. But remember, the entity is still trapped, waiting for an opportunity. We returned home, exhausted but relieved. We felt we had won the battle, but we knew that the war against the darkness would never completely end. The entity was trapped, but there would always be the risk that someone would free it again. As we said goodbye, Clara looked back, her eyes filled with fear. It doesn't end here, she said, her voice full of apprehension. And so our story continues, with the darkness always lurking, waiting for the right moment to return. The true struggle between light and dark had only just begun, and we were prepared to face whatever came next. We knew that it would take all our strength and courage to protect our souls from the shadows that still lurked in the depths of the unknown. In the days that followed, the sense of relief was replaced by a growing fear. Even though the diary was locked and the entity seemed contained, I could still feel that something was wrong. The shadows on the walls of my room seemed to move of their own accord, and at night I would hear incomprehensible whispers that echoed in my mind. One night, while studying for an exam, I felt an intense cold that made my skin crawl. I looked around but saw nothing out of the ordinary. However, the feeling of being watched was undeniable. I tried to ignore it, concentrating on my books, but the fear grew. I decided to call Clara and Mateus, needing their company to dispel this terrifying feeling. They arrived quickly, visibly worried. Lucas, is everything okay? Clara asked, her eyes full of concern. No, I replied, trying to remain calm. I think the entity is still stalking us. I feel its presence all the time. Mateus, always the most skeptical, was beginning to show signs of genuine fear. We need to talk to Mr. Almeida again. Maybe he knows what to do. We returned to the Relics of Time bookstore, where Mr. Almeida greeted us with a dark look. I feared this would happen, 
he said. The entity may be contained, but it is still bound to you. We need to perform a purification ritual to break that bond. He instructed us to gather several specific items for the ritual. Sea salt, black candles, and a rare crystal that could only be found in a cave in the nearby mountains. Despite our fear, we were determined to end this threat once and for all. Our journey to find the crystal was fraught with difficulties. The cave was an ominous place, full of sharp stalactites and narrow passages. With every step, we felt the presence of the strongest entity, as if it were watching us and trying to impede our progress. As we explored the cave, we heard strange noises, rocks rolling, unintelligible whispers, and the sound of something large shuffling in the shadows. We found the crystal on a natural altar, surrounded by ancient symbols carved into the stone. When I picked up the crystal, the cave shook violently, and the shadows around us came to life, forming grotesque, menacing figures. Quickly, let's get out of here, cried Clara, her voice echoing through the cave. We ran back to the entrance, but the shadows followed us, trying to grab us. We felt cold hands touching us, and the feeling of oppression was overwhelming. With one last desperate effort, we managed to get out of the cave and return to the bookstore. That night, we performed the purification ritual in the bookstore. We light the black candles around the circle of salt, and sir, Almeida began to recite the ancient words while holding the crystal. The temperature dropped drastically, and the whispers turned into screams of agony. The shadows in the bookstore writhed frantically, trying to escape the protective circle. Suddenly, the entity appeared in the center of the circle, its hooded figure and eyes glowing with hatred. You can't banish me, she shouted, her voice reverberating like thunder. I am eternal. The candlelight shone brightly, and the crystal began to emit a dazzling glow. We felt the entity's strength weaken, but it continued to fight, trying to break the circle of protection. With one last desperate effort, we joined our voices and recited the final words of the ritual. The light exploded into a blinding glare, and the entity screamed in agony before disappearing completely. We felt true peace for the first time in weeks, but we knew the fighting was far from over. Sir, Almeida stored the crystal in a safe, sealing it with protective symbols. You are free of the entity for now, he said, but there will always be dark forces lurking. They must be prepared to face them. We returned home, exhausted but relieved. We tried to resume our normal lives, but the experience left us scarred in ways we could never forget. The nightmares persisted, and the feeling of being watched never completely went away. One night while I was home alone, I heard a familiar sound of pages turning. I looked at the bookshelf and saw a new diary, identical to the previous one, resting among my books. A shiver ran down my spine, and I realized that the fight against the dark forces was just beginning. I opened the diary with shaking hands, finding the first entry written in handwriting that wasn't mine. It described the death of a person I knew in a horrible and detailed way. I ran to the phone, but when I called her I heard only silence on the other end. The entity had returned and was stronger than ever. Desperate, I returned to the bookstore where Mr. Almeida received me with a somber expression. The entity cannot be destroyed easily, he said. But maybe there's a way to arrest her again. We need a sacrifice to seal the bond. He explained that the sacrifice did not need to be of blood, but of something of immense emotional value. I knew what I should do. I went home and picked up an old photo of my family, the only memory I had of my parents who died when I was a child. That night, we returned to the bookstore and prepared the final ritual. We light black candles around the circle of salt, and sir. Almeida began to recite the old words while I held the photo. The temperature dropped drastically and the whispers turned into screams of agony. The shadows in the bookstore writhed frantically trying to escape the protective circle. The entity appeared again, its hooded figure and eyes glowing with hatred. You can't banish me, she shouted. I am eternal. With one last desperate effort, I gathered all my strength and threw the photo into the circle. The candlelight shone brightly and the crystal began to emit a dazzling glow. 
We felt the entity's strength weaken, but it continued to fight, trying to break the circle of protection. The shadows screamed in pain and began to disintegrate. Suddenly, the entity was sucked back into the diary, which closed with a bang. We felt true peace, but we knew the battle was far from over. Sir, Almeida kept the diary in a safe, sealing it with protective symbols. You are free of the entity for now, he said, but there will always be dark forces lurking. They must be prepared to face them. In the countryside of a small town, there is an abandoned psychiatric clinic, closed for decades under mysterious circumstances. Known to locals as the Clinica São Lázaro, the place has a sinister reputation, fueled by stories of experimental treatments and unexplained disappearances. When a group of medical students decided to explore the clinic for a research project, they had no idea of the horror that awaited them. My name is Rafael. And this is the story of the weekend that changed my life forever. My friends Clara, Pedro, and Luisa and I were excited about the idea of exploring the abandoned clinic. The goal was to collect data for our thesis on psychiatric practices in the last century, but the adventure would soon turn into a nightmare. We arrived at the clinic late in the afternoon. The building, crumbling and overgrown, seemed harmless at first glance. The weathered brick facade and broken windows suggested that no one had set foot there for a long time. A sense of mystery and danger enveloped us as we unloaded our equipment. As we entered, I noticed an air of abandonment that didn't match the tranquility of the exterior. The interior was dark and damp with long, gloomy hallways. Old furniture was scattered about, covered in dust and cobwebs. We decided to split up to cover more area and began exploring the different floors of the clinic. Clara and I were in charge of the ground floor while Pedro and Luisa went up to the upper floors. We walked through the silent hallways, lit only by our flashlights. With each step, the feeling of oppression grew. The walls seemed to pulse with their own energy, and the air was filled with a metallic smell like blood. We found a treatment room with restraint chairs and old medical equipment. Clara, who had always been the most curious of the group, began leafing through the dusty medical records. Look at this, Rafa, she said, holding up a document. It says here that they used electroshocks on patients without consent. Before I could respond, a strange noise echoed through the hallway. I looked out of the room and saw a shadow moving quickly. A shiver ran down my spine. Let's get out of here, I muttered, pulling Clara along. There's something very wrong with this place. As we walked back to the meeting point, we heard light footsteps behind us. We turned quickly, but there was no one there. Did you hear that? Clara asked, her voice shaking. I nodded, feeling fear rise within me. We met Pedro and Luisa in the main hall, their expressions reflecting the same terror we felt. Something is following us, Pedro said, panting. We saw shadows moving through the hallways. We decided to meet in the control room where the medical records and documents were stored. As we searched through the files, we discovered reports of experimental treatments and disturbing notes about patients who had mysteriously disappeared. It seemed as if the clinic had been the scene of unimaginable atrocities. As the night wore on, the strange phenomena intensified. Objects moved on their own. Doors creaked and slammed and whispers echoed through the hallways. The temperature dropped dramatically and the feeling of oppression was almost unbearable. We need to get out of here, Luisa said, her voice filled with panic. This is beyond what we can handle. We agreed and began to gather our equipment. However, when we tried to leave, we discovered that the main door was locked. We tried other exits, but they were all blocked. We were trapped inside the clinic. We decided to go back to the control room and try to find an alternative exit in the clinic's plans. 
As we searched through the documents, I heard a whisper near my ear. Rafa. I looked around, but there was no one there. Fear took over me. Suddenly, the lights flickered and went out completely. Our flashlights were the only source of light, but the batteries were low. Clara held my hand, trembling. This isn't real, she whispered, trying to convince herself. The sound of heavy footsteps approached, and grotesque shadows began to emerge from the walls. Indistinct figures, like specters, moved slowly towards us. Pedro and Luisa's screams echoed through the room, and the feeling of desperation was overwhelming. We have to find a way out, I shouted, pulling Clara towards a corridor we had not yet explored. We ran through the labyrinthine corridors, trying to escape the shadowy figures that pursued us. The air became freezing, and the oppression was almost unbearable. We found a staircase that led to the basement. With no other option, we quickly descended, hoping to find a way out. The basement was even more sinister, with walls covered in strange symbols and stains of dried blood. The feeling of being watched was constant. At the end of the corridor, we found a locked door. Pedro tried to break it down while Luisa and Clara kept their flashlights pointed down the corridor, watching the shadows approach. With a last effort, Pedro managed to open the door, and we quickly entered, locking it behind us. The room was filled with old medical equipment and scattered documents. In the center, there was a restraint chair, still with its blood-stained straps. Clara found an old diary on the table and began to leaf through it quickly. It's the diary of the director of the clinic, she said, her voice full of horror. He describes how he performed experiments on the patients, trying to summon entities from another dimension. They never left this place. As Clara read, shadows began to materialize in the room. Grotesque figures, their faces contorted in pain and rage were slowly advancing. They want revenge, Pedro said, his voice shaking. We knew we had to act quickly. We decided to perform a banishing ritual described in the diary, hoping that it would free the trapped spirits. We gathered the necessary ingredients and began to recite the words of the ritual. The shadowy figures were getting closer, and the oppression was overwhelming. As we recited the incantation, the candles around us glowed brightly and the temperature dropped dramatically. The shadows let out agonized screams and began to disappear, one by one. The feeling of oppression eased, and the air became lighter. Finally, with a last cry of despair, the most grotesque figure disappeared, and the room fell silent. We felt that we had succeeded in banishing the evil entities and freeing the spirits of the patients. We left the room, exhausted but relieved. We found an exit in the basement and were able to leave the clinic. The cool night air was a welcome relief, and a sense of safety finally returned. We decided never to speak of what had happened inside again, but we knew that the experience had left a deep impression on us. As we walked away from the clinic, a sense of profound unease washed over me. I knew that although we had won this battle, the war against the darkness was far from over. The sense that something deeper and darker still lurked in the shadows would not leave us alone. A few weeks later, we were back to our daily lives, trying to come to terms with what had happened. But one night, as I slept, I was awakened by a familiar sound, the whispers. I opened my eyes to see my room dimly lit and the shadows of grotesque figures moving across the walls. The terror returned with overwhelming force. I jumped out of bed and ran into the living room where I saw Pedro and Clara standing there, their faces pale and eyes wide. They're back, Clara said, her voice a shaky whisper. We haven't been able to banish them completely. The whispers grew louder, and the feeling of oppression grew. Shadows began to materialize, forming distorted, menacing figures. A skeletal figure, more sinister than ever, emerged from the corner of the room, its eyes glowing with an evil light. Did you think you could get rid of us? The figure growled, its voice echoing in the room. We are eternal. The windows slammed shut, and the temperature dropped dramatically. We tried to recite the incantation again, but the words seemed to lose their power. The grotesque figures advanced and the feeling of desperation was overwhelming. 
We must do something different, I shouted, trying to think of a solution. Something more powerful. Peter, still shaking, remembered a crucial detail from the diary. There is one last ritual. The most dangerous, it is the only way to banish these entities for good. With no other option, we began to prepare the ritual. We drew the symbol on the floor in our own blood, as described in the journal, and lit candles around it. The shadows around us began to shake violently, letting out screams of agony. As we recited the words of the ritual, the room was filled with a blinding, intense light. The grotesque figures began to dissolve, letting out agonized screams that echoed throughout the house. The skeletal figure advanced, trying to stop us, but the light enveloped it, causing it to disappear in a swirl of shadows and screams. The feeling of oppression gradually eased and the air became lighter. The light faded, leaving us in a silent, deserted room. The shadows and whispers were gone. We sat on the floor, exhausted and relieved, knowing that we had won the hardest battle of our lives. We felt that we had finally managed to banish the evil entities and free the trapped spirits. However, a feeling of uneasiness still persisted. We knew that although we had won this battle, the war against the dark was far from over. The feeling that something deeper and darker still lurked in the shadows wouldn't leave us alone. As we walked away from the house, a feeling of deep discomfort came over me. I knew the real battle was just beginning. We were prepared to fight to the end, but the darkness was insidious and persistent. We needed to find out more about the events that led to the construction of the clinic and the macabre rituals that took place there. The fight against darkness would not end here. The real war for the peace and sanity of our city would continue, night after night, until the last vestige of evil was finally banished. And with each step, we knew we were closer to the truth, but also closer to the true terror that was yet to come. As I looked back one last time, I saw a shadow move quickly around the corner of the room. My heart froze, but there was nothing I could do but keep fighting. The war was far from over, and we were just beginning to understand the true extent of the terror we faced. In a small forgotten town in the countryside, there was an old mansion that no one dared to visit. The Whitley Mansion, known locally as the House of Lost Souls, was a symbol of mystery and terror. Many said that the house was a portal to the afterlife, where lost souls wandered eternally. What few knew was that the mansion hid an even darker secret, and this secret was about to be revealed by a curious photographer. My name is Gabriel. I am 42 years old and a professional photographer. I have always been fascinated by abandoned and mysterious places, seeking to capture the essence of the unknown in my photographs. When I heard about the Whitley Mansion, I knew I had to explore it. My goal was to document the history of the house and capture images that could reveal the secrets hidden within its walls. Little did I know that this decision would change my life forever. I arrived in the town of Belford on a cloudy afternoon. The gray sky and oppressive atmosphere reflected the feeling of apprehension that took over the residence. I stayed at a modest guest house run by Donna Celeste, an elderly woman who seemed to know the local history well. When I mentioned my intention to investigate the mansion, she looked at me with wide eyes and concern. Whitley Mansion is a cursed place, young man. Many have tried to uncover its secrets and ended up being tormented for the rest of their lives. Be careful. Donna Celeste warned her words rather than discouraging me, only increased my determination. The next morning, with my camera, tripod, and a backpack full of supplies, I made my way to the mansion. The building was imposing, with broken windows and ivy-covered walls. The feeling of cold and neglect was palpable. As I walked through the rusty gate, I felt a shiver run down my spine, as if something invisible was watching me. 
I entered the mansion and began to explore the empty hallways and desolate rooms. I found old furniture covered in dust, faded paintings, and objects that spoke of a past of wealth and decadence. I discovered that the mansion had been the scene of several tragic events, including murders and mysterious disappearances. With each new discovery, the feeling of oppression grew stronger. In a room on the second floor, I found an old photo album covered in dust and cobwebs. The photos, yellowed with age, showed people who had lived in the mansion over the years. Happy faces and moments of joy contrasted with the somber air of the place. As I leafed through the album, I began to hear strange sounds around me. Light footsteps echoed through the hallways and indistinct whispers filled the air. The feeling of being watched grew stronger and an intense cold enveloped my body. I continued exploring, trying to ignore the growing fear. As I entered the main room, I saw a large fireplace with an ornate mirror above it. In the reflection of the mirror, I noticed a figure behind me. I turned quickly, but there was no one there. The air became even colder, and the shadows on the walls began to twist eerily. Suddenly, I heard a piercing, terrifying scream that echoed through the mansion, making my heart race. On the opposite wall, I saw a spectral figure emerge from the shadows. It was a woman, dressed in an old-fashioned dress and with eyes full of despair. She reached out to me and her voice echoed in a whisper, Help us. Before I could respond, the figure disappeared, leaving me alone in the darkness. Fear gripped me, but I knew I had to keep investigating. I returned to the room where I had found the photo album, and as I reviewed the images, I found a reference to a hidden basement where dark events had occurred. The next morning, I decided to search the basement. The feeling of oppression was constant, and the whispers and shadows seemed to follow me wherever I went. I found a hidden entrance behind a bookcase. As I entered the basement, the temperature dropped dramatically, and the darkness was almost palpable. I turned on a flashlight and began to slowly descend. The basement was narrow and damp, with mold-covered walls and strange symbols. As I moved forward, the sounds of footsteps and whispers grew louder. I felt an oppressive presence around me, as if something were watching me closely. At the end of the basement, I found a large, dark chamber with a stone altar in the center. The walls were covered in ancient inscriptions and symbols of occult rituals. As I explored the chamber, I felt a cold hand touch my shoulder. I turned quickly, but there was no one there. The air grew even colder and the shadows on the walls began to twist eerily. Suddenly, I heard a piercing, blood-curdling scream that echoed through the chamber, making my heart race. On the far wall, I saw a shadowy figure emerge from the shadows. It was a grotesque entity, with glowing red eyes and an overwhelming presence. You shouldn't be here. The entity's voice was a scream of multiple souls, a cacophony of pain and despair. Its presence was overwhelming, and the shadows around it advanced upon me with indescribable force. Panicking, I began to recite the words of a banishing spell I had found in an ancient ritual book. My voice shook with fear, but I pressed on, focusing all my energy on banishing the entity. The shadows retreated momentarily, and the entity screamed in fury, its form shaking. This is not the end, it screamed before being torn apart by the light emanating from the stone altar. The shadows vanished, and the chamber fell silent. Relief was instant, but the sense that something was still wrong remained. I hurried back up to the mansion, exhausted and shivering from the cold. Back at the inn, Donna Celeste looked at me with a worried expression. You found more than you bargained for, didn't you? She asked in a soft voice. I told her everything that had happened and she just nodded, as if she had expected it. The entity you faced is ancient and powerful. It will not be banished so easily. Be careful. The following days were filled with a growing obsession. I searched through every document, interviewed the town's elders, and consulted occult experts. I discovered that the entity known as the Watcher had been summoned by a local cult that performed dark rituals to gain power and immortality. The souls of the victims of these rituals were trapped in the mansion, tormented and seeking revenge. With the help of an experienced occultist, 
I prepared a new ritual to try to banish the Watcher and purify the mansion once and for all. We returned to the site on the next full moon, taking all the necessary materials. The atmosphere was even more oppressive, and each step towards the mansion was accompanied by a growing sense of dread. We made our way back to the underground chamber, the feeling of being watched growing stronger. Upon reaching it, we lit the candles and drew new protective symbols. We began to recite the ritual, our voices echoing in the shadowy chamber. Suddenly, a gust of cold wind blew out all the candles, plunging us into darkness. I felt the overwhelming presence around me, and denser, more aggressive shadows began to move in the room. The Watcher manifested himself again, his figure of pure darkness with red eyes glowing in the darkness. You cannot defeat me. The Watcher's voice was a scream of multiple souls, a cacophony of pain and despair. The room shook, and the shadows advanced upon us with indescribable strength. The occultist screamed, trying to keep up the recitation, but he was dragged into the darkness. With a supreme effort, I managed to light a final candle and recite the final words of the ritual. The candlelight shone brightly, and the figure of the Watcher screamed in agony, his shadowy form being torn apart by the light. The shadows receded, and the sense of oppression began to ease. When the light finally disappeared, the chamber was silent. The Watcher had been banished, but at a high cost. I was exhausted and could barely breathe. I climbed the stairs back to the main floor of the mansion, feeling a sense of relief mixed with unease. The battle seemed won, but a part of me knew that evil would never be completely eradicated. That night, as I lay in my bed at the inn, I heard the whisper again. This is not over. This time the whisper was followed by a low, sinister laugh echoing through the room. The oppressive presence returned, and shadows began to move on the walls, forming indistinct figures. The true terror had only just begun, and I knew that my fight against evil was far from over. My investigation had only scratched the surface of what was truly happening at Whitley Manor. The dark forces that inhabited this place were still lurking, waiting for their chance to return. I knew I needed to continue my research, learn more about the rituals, and find a definitive way to banish the evil. Days turned into weeks, and though the disturbing events diminished, they never completely disappeared. Objects in my home disappeared and reappeared in different places. Shadows moved in the corners of my eyes, and whispers in the darkness were constant. I knew something darker was coming, and I needed to be prepared. As I walked the streets of Belford, I began to notice that other residents were also affected. Suspicious looks and expressions of fear were common. I decided I needed to investigate further, not just in the mansion, but in the city itself. What other dark secrets did Belford hide? The battle against evil was far from over. The abandoned mansion, town, and other locations could hide more clues and dark rituals. I was determined to figure it all out, knowing that each step took me deeper into the shadows of the past and toward an uncertain and dangerous future. The feeling of being watched never completely went away, and the whispers became part of my life. Every day was a fight against fear, but I knew I needed to keep going. The battle against evil never truly ended, and I was prepared to face it again. Knowing that the darkness never completely disappeared and that the true terror was just beginning. And so, my life continued, with the constant feeling that something dark was still lurking, ready to emerge at any moment. The fight against the forces of evil in Whitley Manor and the city was never ending. I was prepared to face whatever came, knowing that each step brought me closer to the truth and the final liberation of imprisoned souls. The true horror was just beginning and I knew my fight against evil was far from over.